this country is at war with Germany. With Germany. We shall go on to the end. I remember the sheets of flame which came up and almost blinded us from our guns. Hello and welcome to another episode of the World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. The Parachute Regiment was formed in 1940 and eventually raised 17 battalions. It would see service in North Africa, Sicily, Italy, Normandy, Arnhem and would cross the Rhine as part of the largest airborne assault ever undertaken. To discuss the formation of the regiment and its history through World War II, I'm joined by historian and broadcaster Mark Urban who has written an authorised history of the regiment called Red Devils, the Trailblazers of the Parachute Regiment in World War II. But before we get started, it's a big thank you to all those who have supported the podcast by becoming patrons. A dollar or so from people like you, loyal listener, help me find the time to put the show together. You can find out more at patreon.com slash ww2podcast. I really do value your support and when possible I try to make available extra bits and bobs exclusive for patrons. A bit more World War II chat, as it were. So that's patreon.com slash ww2podcast. So, on to our main feature. Mark, um, thank you for joining me. Um, Can we start by looking at the formation of the regiment? Um, It's interesting as we enter the war in 1939 that we, the British, have no parachute unit in the army. So who's the driving force behind the formation of of the unit? What was... What function were they expecting the unit to uh, to fulfil? Well, I think if you if you look at the history, the early history of the parachute regiment, it it, it metamorphoses through several stages in the space of the war years. The idea of what it was for, and therefore what you had to expect from its soldiers, was really changing and was really dynamic. So, in its first incarnation or first um, stage of this of this uh, evolution. Uh, it's very much about the mood after Dunkirk and, and Britain being on the back foot. And, of course, it's Winston Churchill himself who, in June 1940, issues this order uh, that we need a body of parachute troops, which I, I think in the original memo he says 5,000. And, of course, that was of a piece with uh, the, the orders he'd given just a few weeks apart from that to set up the Special Operations Executive to set Europe ablaze, as it were. And, and in those very early days, if you look at the sort of latter part of 1940, 1941, when they were training these uh, soldiers who had been in this commando battalion uh, to become parachutists, it became the first parachute battalion. Uh, they, they crossed over a fair amount at Ringway with their jump training with French resistance or or other resistance agents who were training for the SOE who were also being taught to parachute in. And and so at that early stage, it was really about, look, can we do something to keep the war going on the continent to not be completely strategically on the back foot? And so the parachute regiment was conceived as a way of putting in raiding parties, very much in the way that actually happened uh, early in 1942 with the Bruneval raid, when 120 or so members of the second parachute battalion went into Normandy to, to get the parts of a radar station. And they, you know, they were ashore for like four hours and came back uh, uh, mission, you know, job done. It was a very successful mission. So that's, so that's really the, the, the beginning. That's how it starts with the order from Churchill uh, leading to the formation of, of this group of, of parachute units, which pretty quickly starts to grow but at the point, even when they do Bruneval, they haven't really got the aircraft and the know-how to, to do sort of large scale. You know, the 12 uh, Whiteley bombers that are used to take them to Bruneval, is pretty much, that's pretty much the limit of the RAF's commitment to the whole parachute venture at that point. So it's all a pretty small scale thing right up to that point of the Where war. Where are they drawing men from? Because obviously conscription comes in and the, the army you know, vastly expands very quickly. Um are they press ganging men in? Are they conscripting men into the airborne? Are they looking for a certain type of man? I mean, the, the Americans are very keen on getting the best of the best into their, you know, mentally and physically into their airborne units and uh, 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 to be seen as sort of a, a super elite, supermen sort of units. So where, where, where are the British drawing the men from? 
Well, you've got that initial cohort who are in the um, who are in the commandos, and then they're, they're briefly called the Eleventh uh, um, Special Air Service Battalion, and then they become the first parachute battalion of the Army Air Corps, as it is at the time. Then, in in the latter part of 1941, late summer, uh, the call goes out volunteers. The decision's taken. The key figure, I think, in this is the, is the chief of the Imperial General Staff. You know, let's let's build this bigger. Let's let's build a brigade or whatever. Let's have several battalions. Uh, and the first battalion it becomes the kind of seed corn, providing cadres for three more. So you get four battalions formed in Britain at that time, going through into the early part of 1942. So through that autumn of 41 and the winter, those four battalions are formed. And they're formed from around 2,000 volunteers who come from across the army and a a sort of absolutely extraordinary variety of people, whether they're, you know, uh, from Scottish regiments, the Royal Ulster Rifles, you know, the Royal Welsh Fusiliers. I mean, every conceivable type of regiment, every conceivable type of person. But broadly, what you can say they tend to have in common is they tend to be older guys who are fed up with barrack room bull and spit and polish, and they want to get into action. And one of the early members of the first parachute battalion actually says that 70% of that initial cadre were men who'd seen action before. And that would have been on the northwest frontier of India. Uh, That might have been in the Spanish Civil War even. There were a lot of adventurer types uh, in that early cohort. And generally, they were older. You know, obviously, the conscripts were coming in at 18, 19. But a lot of these guys, I focus my story on six particular soldiers. And when we meet a handful of them, uh, they're they're all part of that 2,000 that volunteered, uh, or several of them are part of it. You know, I point out that one of them is a lance corporal of 28. You know, another is a sergeant of 30. Major Geoffrey Pine Coffin, he's already been in the army for 14 years by that point. He's 32. So these are really older, more experienced guys that, than the typical conscripts that are coming in or the junior officers coming through the OPTU system, you know, who might be 19 or 20. They're quite different in that sense. And they form, if you like, the, the, the vital first cadre or the the the, the, the the founding fathers, the trailblazers, as we call them in the title of the book, of the regiment. And they're the guys who, in, in late 1942, as the first parachute brigade, three of those four early battalions are sent to North Africa, where they have terrible, terrible struggles, you know, in their fights in the, in the uh, Tunisian mountains in the middle of winter. And a lot of them don't come back. I mean, of the 1,800 sent, there are 1,800 sent and there are 1,700 casualties in that campaign. Uh, now, obviously, those figures, you know, there are reinforcements at times, and some of those casualties are wounded who come back into the line. You know, it's a complex equation, but that figure gives an insight into just how costly the campaign was. But by the end of that campaign in May 1943, you can truly say that the, the reputation of the parachute regiment, particularly amongst its enemies, has been established. Well, I was going to ask about that, about because because in many respects, that Tunisia Operation Torch campaigns. When you think about the parachute regiment, you might have got Operation Biting, you might, you know, Sicily, D Day, Arnhem, that's the war. And actually, there is this operation in uh, North Africa. What, is it, what are they doing? Because it, it is completely overlooked when you sort of think about parachute operations in the public sort of memory of the war. What have they been tasked with? Had they worked out whether they're wanting to be raiding or whether they're wanting to be a larger component? Uh, at that point, or are they still sort of trying to figure out what they're meant to be doing? Yeah, that's a, I mean, that's a fascinating question. I, I mean, I think that one could say that the idea of what they're for is evolving very quickly at that point. So when they're sent out, it's definitely with the idea of um, parachute assault. And each of the three battalions carries out one deliberate parachute assault. The second parachute battalion, which is the one that is particularly closely followed in my book, they drop at this Udna place, uh, trying to take out a series of, of airfields not far from Tunis. And that turns into an absolute disaster. But the operations that the first and third parachute battalions mounted uh, is, as part of the Operation Torch that sequence of events were pretty successful. And the idea was there, in the case of the third battalion, the first to go, that they dropped at this port, uh, called Bone, which was very near the Algeria-Tunisia frontier, 
And if we remember the overall context of Operation Torch was that while Rommel and the Italians were kind of looking one way uh, towards Montgomery, that th- to, to, to make landings of a large scale force behind them, as it were, to the west of their main supply bases and, and logistics hubs in Libya and Tunisia, and to land west of those behind them and force them to fight on two fronts. So it was vital to uh, General Eisenhower, who was commanding the operation, uh, the Allied Expeditionary Force for that Operation Torch, to really get up up there into Tunis as quickly as he could. And so the hope was, well, if we if we land and take a port like Bone that we can that we can use, uh, that the third battalion was dropped on, then we can race up the coast and land troops there, relieve them by sea. Similarly, this, the first battalion dropped in a place called Mejdez al Bab, which was like the key, one of the key passes through the mountains on the border into Tunisia. So, so the idea was if we seize this choke point, a bit like the, the operation in the Israelis mounted 956, the, the, the Mitla the Pass, if we seize this with parachute assault, we can make it much easier for our troops to get into Tunis and really mess up the Axis forces in North Africa. So that was the strategic logic. But in terms of how it then evolved for the parachute battalions, they each made their parachute assault. There were only enough planes for them to drop at battalion strength at that point. And they did it. And then what happened was they very quickly, because other troops just didn't get up to the frontier that quickly or they proved inadequate, and it was a long old frontier, you know, the Tunisian border, the the Germans recovered from the initial shock. They consolidated their positions. And they were now facing in two directions, west and east. And they were resisting. They were trying to stop the Allies getting in. So they then got involved in this um, long battle along the frontier. And uh, as as you may recall, you know, there, there were setbacks, for example, when Rommel attacked the Americans at the Kasserin Pass. And there were other moments where, you know, the British did quite well. And often it was either the parachute brigade or the guards brigade that were used to spearhead infantry assaults on, on jebels, you know, high points that were key to the, to the, to the sort of advance through this, this uh, borderland. I think a lot of them, you know, having trained so hard for parachute operations and, and realising day after day, week after week, that they were taking these awful casualties up on these mountaintops, where, frankly, I, I'm not sure the strategic logic of what they were doing was, was so clear to a lot of the men. You know, the Germans and the Italians were just trying to delay the inevitable, really, these guys were really suffering. I mean, the casualties were, were very heavy and they stood fast. You know, they, they remained the most reliable and picked troops. And one of the letters home I, I, I discovered and I felt really lifted that part of the narrative was from a young subaltern in the second parachute battalion. And he says something like, I, 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 I realised that we have done what, what is being called a historic thing here. And he also has this um, rather humorous rate of exchange where he basically says something like, oh, you know, the way it works here is, uh, you know, one American division is equivalent to one uh, guards battalion. One guards battalion is a, is equivalent to two paratroopers. Uh, therefore, we get all the dirty jobs. Well, clearly there was a bit of um, sort of humour and and there may be a bit of hubris in that. But the, the basic point that, that they really established, particularly with the high commander reputation, I think is is well made, and and that's why, in a way, it's very odd that the North African ca- campaign hasn't had more attention in in histories uh, of airborne warfare or of the parachute regiment, and, and that's something I was keen to to put right in. I book. think it's because they're not fighting on, on geographically the the Monty side of the battle, so Monty Monty steals the the show, and it, I think it must have been under Anderson, who who sort of is is. Uh, Never gets a light put on him because Monty grabs all the all the celebrity for himself, and so that sort of those actions sort of get overlooked, which is a shame because it, it's, as you say, they're, they're terrible, terrible fighting, s- slogging away in those hills. You meant you, you mentioned the guards a couple of times now, and I, I, and what I was something that had occurred to me when I was reading through the British Army can be quite likes to certain regiments have certain uh, status. Well, when you have a new regiment like the parachute regiment with no status, does that attract a certain type of volunteer? Because at the top you have Boy Browning, who I think's a guardsman, isn't he? And is he is he driving it to be some sort of elite guards regiment, or is or, or do we find more grammar school sort of uh, officer class in there rather than um, 
Eton and Harrow and, and, and the top British public schools as the officers? Yeah, look, I mean, I think that's a, you know, that's a really interesting subject because, as we know, the British Army is a very tribal organisation, and, and so the question immediately is posed when someone forms a new regiment or corps. Yeah, how do they fit in exactly with this tribal uh, ecosystem? You know, and of course, when all your guys are coming from other backgrounds initially, because there is no established parachute career path at that point, you know, 1941 or whatever, when they're getting the volunteers, people come in with all kinds of different answers. Now, clearly, Browning was rather critical to this because he he, he was given command uh, late in 1941 of the Airborne Division, as it was called there, i.e. his mission was to expand the forces they'd already got, which was four battalions in Britain, also one in India and one in Egypt, but that's a different story, uh, into a division. And Browning was very, very much a creature of the guards. And when he did his ethos cards, you know, they said, you. he basically said, you are the elite and you've got to be better than everybody else. And it, including, he used this word, turnout. Now, Browning, for Browning, turnout was a really all-embracing term. It wasn't just having bull boots uh, and sharp creases on your battle dress. You know, your fingernails, your hair, your ears. He got men on, on inspections, on parades, to take their boots off to see whether there were any holes in their socks. You know, I, I mean, it was a whole state of mind. And Browning also, I think, had that belief that, you know, perhaps many a guard sergeant major uh, might have espoused in, in other times and places that, if you've got everybody marching together and, and you know, executing their halt uh, precisely and crisply on word of command and all the rest of it and about face and all, you know, the drill commands, that you would blend together these guys, you know. Now, obviously, the ones who'd come from the Light Infantry Division, uh, uh, you know, they march faster. Uh, 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 and, uh, the, you know, the standard infantrymen had one, uh, you know. So, so, so I think what Browning thought was, ah, yes, well, you know, we'll give them the old, army medicine uh, to get them all to cohere together better and we'll set these very high standards because you know if 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 we if we deal with appearance we will bring about the right state of mind and i think in this sense he completely misread the soldiers that that he got who you know as i was saying you know they were older a lot of them were frustrated with square bashing and and just the the boredom of peacetime soldiering, waiting for the Germans to invade if they had the you know gumption to do so, sort of thing. And and there were a lot of scenes, you know, uncovering you know in the archives accounts written by soldiers about that period, you know, late summer nineteen forty one through nineteen forty two before they go to North Africa. There's a lot of scenes of like rebellion almost. And you mentioned the officer class. I mean. When Johnny Frost, the famous Johnny Frost, who's one of my chosen characters, you know, kept centre stage in this narrative, takes the 2nd Parachute Battalion to North Africa, two of his three company commanders are guys promoted from the ranks. He, he, he describes one of them as difficult to deal with because of his socialist tendencies. Uh, and if you look in, in more detail at that, at that A company of the 2nd Parachute Battalion, it's quite remarkable, really. You've got the company commander who definitely, his mindset is, is very left-wing, it's socialist. You've got another guy who's, who's a platoon commander of his who ends up being a minister in Harold Wilson's Labour government. He, he is Labour through and through, you know. So we, you know, we must think of them as people, and, and as, as you suggested, a grammar school uh, boy. And so we must think of that early selection of soldiers as having every kind of opinion, every kind of background, every kind of religious background, some of them very irreligious, some of them communists. Uh, it was in that sense, in terms of 1941 Britain, very diverse. And therefore, to try and impose a kind of guards culture of saluting and only speak where you're spoken to. I mean, one of the rules on, on Browning's ethos card was kind of, you know, no, no idle chatter. I mean, he basically was telling them all to shut up. It, it obviously went down very, down very badly with those soldiers, with their sort of wild individualistic spirit. So, yeah, that, that was a big part of the ferment, I think, in, in, in those parachute battalions uh, through 1942 when they were waiting to go to North Africa. He's a fascinating character, is, is Browning. And their next operation after North Africa is Husky in Sicily. But then he's, they're forced in to work with uh, the Americans, aren't they, and, and uh, Ridgeway. Ridgeway's from a, a very different background. How does that relationship 
work between the American and British Airborne. I might have got this right. I'm, I'm thinking on my feet here, but I have a funny feeling this would be the first combat drop for the Americans, where I suppose the British can say at least they've done it a couple of times with uh, biting and in, in, into North Africa. Well, the first cooperation is when a single airborne battalion, if I recall correctly, I think it was the second battalion of the 503rd parachute infantry, but please don't have a moan. It, 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 the, the, the battalion number is correct in the book. They get sent to England in the summer of 1942 with four dozen Dakotas for them to train with. Now, this is a big turning point for the British paratroopers because suddenly, and based not far away from Salisbury Plain, where they all are at the moment, there are these Americans and they've got these Gucci aircraft. And, of course, the Brits immediately, they've been jumping 10 or 12 at a time out of Wellington or Whiteley bombers. They immediately think, Christ, we can get, you know, two dozen guys into one of these planes or at least 20. And we don't have to drop through a hatch in the floor. It's all it's this is proper. You know, um, as one of the paratroopers describes it, Brits, when he goes for a drop, it's like a Rolls Royce compared with what we've been what we've been dealing with. Another one says it's like sitting on the London Underground compared with being in a Whiteley bomber. So there, there is that cooperation at that stage, Angus. When they go out to North Africa, that American parachute battalion is part of, of the British 1st Parachute Brigade. And, of course, the Brits, in classic borrower's fashion, use their planes, their Dakotas. But they, do, they, are, they are under joint command, effectively. And the Americans do make a, a combat drop at a place called Tabessa, which was on the sort of, it was rather further inland than the, than the three British drops. But they do, they do have a combat drop on a Vichy French airfield deep in, in, in the hinterland there in, in Algeria. And they take it. I mean, there's not much opposition. They take that. So in theory, they, they have um, you know, got going uh, before Husky. But you're right that by the time we're talking about Husky, you're talking about entire regimental combat teams or, or uh, you know, we might call them brigades of the 82nd Airborne Division being dropped on successive nights of, of that invasion of Sicily. And so, you know, up then they're really in the big boys league once they're doing that. And by that point, of course, later in the summer of 1943, they've, they've got enough aircraft in Sicily to do these big drops, you know, rather than the 40 to 45 that were used in the torch drops from a single battalion. You're talking about, you know, 110 to 130 Dakotas at a time moving in formation with either a brigade in the British sense or a regimental combat team of the uh, of the 82nd Airborne Division or, of course, equally large glider-borne landings. So the whole thing is kicked up a, a level uh, uh, with Operation Husky, but, of course, with, with very mixed results in the sense that the all-arms or inter-service coordination is so poor that you get these epic and terrible friendly fire episodes where the Americans, uh, I think on the second night of, of the operation, they have a force of Dakotas going in with, with a regimental combat team that gets hit by the fleet. And uh, I think it's something like 300 American paratroopers and airmen die. Like a dozen planes are shot down by the fleet. So it's it's friendly fire, uh, you know, on the most epic and tragic scale. And, and similarly, the, the British had big problems flying in on the eastern side of the island over the Royal Navy ships, where initially the landings by the first air landing brigade, i.e. gliders, uh, had a similar treatment. And a lot of the American pilots decided just to turn around facing all this flak over the warships. And the whole thing was an absolute debacle. And then the night of Operation Marston, which was the first parachute brigade operation, I think five nights into Husky, possibly four, but it's well into the operation by then. And of course, by that point, the soldiers know what's happened with some of the previous waves. They know that they've been engaged by the fleet. And lo and behold, the same thing happens to them. They've got, I think it's something in the region of um, 130, 140 Dakotas taking them in. And like a third of those aircraft end up turning back and going back to uh, Tunisia because the flak is too heavy. Several of them are shot down. And then of the remainder, a lot of the guys are scattered 
all over eastern Sicily, but about a third of the forces landed reasonably close to the bridge that they've been told to seize. That's the operation where Colonel Pearson threatens to shoot the pilot, isn't it, if he turns round? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I think that's pretty well attested. Well, of course, Alistair Pearson, I mean, if we talk about trailblazers, absolutely extraordinary man. I mean, he was 27 when he was given command uh, of the 1st Parachute Battalion in Tunisia. His family were bakers by trade. He, he was not a professional soldier. He established a rapport. So the other two COs, British ones, in the 1st Parachute Brigade at that time, Geoffrey Pine Coffin with the 3rd Battalion and Johnny Frost with the 2nd, they were both professional army officers and they were both a little bit older than Pearson, a few years older. And they kind of looked on with a mixture of sort of envy and, 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 and the sense of competition. They, they were all in competition with one another to some extent. And Johnny Frost sort of said something like, oh, he had the uncanny ability to sort of be in the right place at the right time. But I, I think perhaps he wasn't sort of levelling with himself about the degree to which Pearson made his own luck. You know, he was a very dynamic and inspirational commander. I think he addressed soldiers, you know, in a sense, the very opposite to someone like Browning. He addressed soldiers in the language of the Glasgow streets, you know, uh, where he was from. And, and, you know, if necessary, I mean, there are accounts of him guys reluctant to pick themselves up and move to the attack he'd kick them you know he'd tell them to get on or, or, or they'd be finished you know he was very direct in his methods uh, and there's a great account from an officer in the third battalion who who was lent to them where he basically says pearson sent them up to the top of this jebel in, in tunisia his orders were you know that very very basic go up there hold it you know it's going to be very very hard you, you might be wiped out sort of thing but that's your job. Go and do it. You know, very, very straight, very direct. No euphemisms. A very sort of um, simple but effective style of command. Now, Pearson ended up being one of only eight people among the millions who served through World War II to get the, the Distinguished Service Order four times. So he he was a remarkable character. So back in Britain, when 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 you've got uh, Richard Windy Gale looking on uh, uh, and t- training, you know, they'll be starting to train for. Um... DD and Overlord. And when they're reviewing, they're going over the post-mortem of Husky and the Sicily operations. Are they thinking to themselves, well, this work, that doesn't work. Well, clearly we've only got a third drop on target and a third become prisoners and a third become casualties. What do we need to change? Is there a, is there a learning curve that we're starting to see or is the learning curve just throwing more men at it? Oh, yes. I think, I think there is a learning curve. I mean, I think in the wake of Sicily, the big emphasis was on the training of air crew. So the, the, the feeling was in First Airborne Division after the setbacks that they had in Sicily, that a lot of these young American airmen, I mean, they literally might have been 19 or 20 flying a Dakota. Some of them were old, uh, uh, mobilized airline pilots, but a lot of them were, were kids. And that, that, that they really didn't know what they were doing. And although they had had preparatory exercises and jumps, prior to, to, to the invasion of Sicily, that this training hadn't been thorough enough, you know, to do with being able to line up properly, to deliver soldiers at the right altitude, in the right place, at night. And so that was the, certainly the big, when you read the kind of after action, the lessons learned report from, from Sicily, it's about the need for more, better trained, more cooperation, which really in the end means a lot more exercises and dry runs. Uh, with 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 para uh, drops and glider drops. Now the Americans they drew slightly different lessons from it. So when when the time comes to go from Sicily to to the mainland of Italy, the British at that point are sort of they're not on strike exactly, but they're saying we are not doing any more airborne operations while these issues of interoperating with 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 the aircraft are unsolved. They basically refused to do more airborne operations during that period for a few months in the in the latter part of 1943. Uh, the Americans basically being forward leaning, it's just no crack on. Let's fly a whole airborne division into Rome. Yeah, at one point they they're about to set off when when um, when the Italian government's about to surrender to try and do a sort of astounding coup de main. In the end, that doesn't happen. But they did fl- they did drop a, a regimental combat team into the um, into the bridgehead in in the south of Italy when they landed to to reinforce their troops there. So they did. The Americans kept operating. The Brits took a pause 
The other thing which I think you can say, and, and this, you know, this is one of those really sort of delicate issues where you see circumlocution in all the uh, official reports and euphemism. And a lot of questions, I think, after Sicily about dropping at night. And I think the understanding is there. Certainly it was with Johnny Frost and the 2nd Battalion. That if some of your men are what I would call shy paras, and they want to just sort of lie low until they see which way the battle is going, that's a lot easier at night. So there is a sort of germ of doubt and worry about this, I think, which starts. And when, and when you look at the war diaries after that, those operations in Sicily, there's an enormous amount of ten- attention given to debriefing all the soldiers about where exactly did you drop and what did you do? And, and you know, when did you finally, because some of them, you know, they were dropped 10, 15 miles away from the, from the objective, the Primacelli Bridge. So, I mean, realistically, it wasn't fair to have expected them to, t- to have taken part in that battle. But others were dropped very close. And Johnny Frost started looking at this and saying, hang on a minute, I saw these guys earlier in the evening. So some of them fell into the bag and were taken prisoner. Some of them appeared later. And there was a sort of, hey, where have you been sort of idea about some of those soldiers. So so there was that going on as well. And that big uh, exercise about sort of debriefing everybody and finding out where everyone f- uh, dropped and all the rest of it, that was, of course, and partly and most importantly about this question of air crews and whether or not they were up to the job of dropping people in the right place, you know, if they were running into the, the drop zone under fire, uh, flak, uh, or would they panic and drop people all over the place because they just wanted to get back to base as quickly as possible and safely as possible? You know, there was an element of that too. So all these uncomfortable issues were being dealt with after Sicily. You know, to what extent had the pilots turned tail because they were afraid, you know, not all of them had Alistair Pearson pointing a gun to their heads to, to, to run into the drop zone, and to what extent had some of the men on the ground taken advantage of the cover of darkness to just lie low and see how events turned out. And so then, of course, later in the war, I mean, obviously the D-Day was a night drop, but Operation Market, September 1904, and Varsity were, were daylight drops, where, where I think the feeling had been that in all respects, you know, getting guys in the right place, that, that that question of dropping accurately, linking them up quickly with their equipment and not allowing the shy para the chance to lie low, uh, that daytime was better. I, I wondered if DD actually sh- shines a light on that specifically because you get you have that amazing success at Pegasus Bridge, which is a small number of men doing the classic coup de man operation where they go in very quickly seize the objective they're almost landing on top of the objective but then you get the the, the, the slightly bigger operations where it all becomes starts to fall to pieces as men just get cast to the four winds you, then, then you think well actually it, it it doesn't really work when you're trying to get a lot of men in uh, on a night unless you're being extremely laser specific on what you're what you're trying to achieve yeah, I mean, there was a big, I think there was a big post-mortem with, um, with the operations on the night of D-Day as well, because as we know, that the 7th Battalion who went there to reinforce the, the, the glider troops from the Ox and Bucks who seized those two bridges, and then it was the 7th Battalion whose command they came under and who resisted the German counterattacks. I mean, when they went to the bridges, their, their commanding officer, um, Colonel Pine Coffin, he only had half of his battalion there. And actually, when you look in, there are maps done in the post-mortems about where they all dropped, like colour-coded maps. A lot of them dropped in pretty much broadly the right area. So the question is, yeah, it was different, for example, with the 9th Battalion and the Merville Battery, where a lot of them had been dropped way off target, you know, in in these flooded areas of, of farmland close to the River Deve. That, that was different. But with the 7th Battalion, a lot of them were broadly dropped in the right area. But, so, you know, a significant number didn't appear. Now, once again, the questions, you know, the next day, kind of where were you? Very, very difficult because a lot of these guys had absolutely tried to do the right thing and, and get to the right place at great risk to themselves. But some of them had said, 
well, let's just go in this barn and work out who's where in the morning. You know what I mean? And and Pine Coffin himself confessed that for 40 minutes after landing, and he landed really close to where he was supposed to land, he had struggled to work out where he was. And it was only when a, an aircraft dropped a flare and, and the spire of the Ronville uh, church was lit up that he suddenly realised exactly where he was. And he was pretty much where he should have been. But he talks about being in a panic uh, because he knows he's got to get to the bridges as quickly as possible. Uh, but he's not sure which direction to head in. So all of those factors are there at night. You know, uh, you can have the, sol- you know, the most highly trained and keen soldiers in the world and they can be genuinely lost. Uh, or you can have small parties of guys blundering about, you know, bumping into groups of Germans trying to get out of there. You know, short range contacts, chaos, confusion, members of other parachute battalions they suddenly run into. Uh, so all of those factors are there in a night drop to, to, a, to a greater extent than, than at daytime. We're going to take a short break. We'll be back with you in a moment. Welcome back. I'm talking to Mark Urban about the Parachute Regiment. We sort of touched upon Market Garden. So back in the UK during uh, Overlord, uh, the, the Invasion of France, that there is the first airborne division who are rebuilding it from Af- from fighting in Africa. And they go to General Urquhart put in charge. Is Urquhart another guardsman? I was gonna say, he's not from an airborne. No, he's a Highland. I think he's from a, a Highland regiment. Well, what, but I, could be wrong. What, what I was slightly intrigued about when you get somebody like that, you bring in uh, to rebuild the regiment in sort of forty four. Does he come with his own ideas, not necessarily having already taken part in a, a, in in airborne operations? Yeah, absolutely. Well, he's very much a, a creature of the kind of Montgomery school. You know, that's the system. He he had command of an independent infantry brigade in Italy. And he pleased Monty, uh, who was therefore keen for him to take over the Airborne Division. He didn't have any background in the Airborne Division, and that caused him to be looked upon, I think, with some suspicion when he arrived. And that was very much mutual. You know, his Urquhart's view was that these guys uh, thought they knew it all, was, was the sort of phrase he used. Uh, and he actually found them wanting in various respects. Now, you have to understand that there was a sort of depth of anger within. Uh, particularly the 1st Parachute Brigade and the 1st Air Landing Brigades, after what they'd been through in Tunisia and and Sicily, a feeling that, you know, a lot of lives had been lost because of um, either incompetence or, or, or missteps by the senior commanders, a feeling that, you know, like with a lot of soldiers who've been in action a few times, well, you know, I was lucky. I got through that. Will I be lucky next time? So, so a sense of some uh, trepidation about about the possibility of further combat. Then, of course, you get reinforcements sent in to make up the strength once they got back from the Mediterranean, and there are sometimes some slightly odd culture clashes. Well, there were a load of guys, for example, drafted into the first battalion from from I think it was the Welsh Fusiliers. And they were Welsh speakers and, you know, they formed almost a separate cohort within the battalion. And, of course, you get all the old sweats, uh, sometimes in rather petty ways, sort of basically saying, oh, you know, you, you're you not as good as us and you've got no idea you weren't in North Africa or you weren't at the Prima Soli Bridge or whatever, yeah, whatever their gripe was or whatever their stance was about new arrivals. So you've got a tricky business. And, and you know, this was something that a lot of units had to do in the war, you know, observe, uh, absorb casualty, um, casualty replacements and, and, and reform things. But certainly led to some very tricky moments in, in, um, in England when the 1st Airborne Division had come back. And, and um, you know, we talked about Urquhart, but there was a, a CO appointed to um, command the 1st Battalion who very quickly, I mean, literally in a matter of a week, week, a week or two, managed to get them completely on edge and mutinous because he tried to insist on standards of regular army discipline and behaviour. So including, for example, things like church parade, which the guys in, in the first parachute brigade, when they'd been in, uh, in North Africa, they completely abandoned church parades. They literally, a lot of them had refused to go. You know, they, they, some of them were communists, some of them were free thinkers, you know, some of them just said, no, I'm not going to do it. It's not that, you know, that's not what we're about. So the, the CO of the 1st Battalion tried to reintroduce compulsory church parade 
in the first battalion. And there were lots of other things going on too, which was more along the lines of the grounding, spit and polish type stuff, which led in in April uh, of 1944 to what was described as a mutiny in the first parachute battalion, where they basically refused, 200 men refused to draw their parachutes to go on an exercise that evening. Delegation of senior officers were sort of sent along to hear their grievances. They were all paraded you know, it was like, who's going to speak first? Of course, none of the men wanted to, to to appear to be the ringleader, but eventually they started calling out their grievances. And a week later, the, the CO was sacked and he was moved to another battalion. So there were these difficulties when they got back. Uh, there were a lot of guys who were angry. You know, they felt they'd been misused. They felt a lot of men had died unnecessarily in the Mediterranean. And, you know, the whole question about how they would be used in, in what some called the bloodbath, the coming uh, second front battle, was an open question. Now, a lot of these guys and a lot of the keener young officers, for example, who were posted to 1st Airborne Division after it got back, fully expected that they would be on the D-Day operation. And in the month or two before D-Day, they still thought that. They only realised at the last minute it wasn't going to be them. And then they were absolutely despondent when they realised it was, it was Gale's 6th Airborne Division that was going to have the honour of of doing the inland drops for D-Day. I mean, in a way, even worse, they made a fantastic job of it. So it, so it was an operation that was free of a lot of the kind of mismanagement and, and tragic consequences. Not to say they didn't lose a lot of soldiers, the 6th Airborne Division, on, on the night of D-Day and the first day or two after. They did lose a lot of men. But they were completely successful in fulfilling their objectives. Uh, and I think that also rankled. And one of the young you know, keen young subalterns who who kept a journal in, in the second parachute battalion in in uh, in their base in in uh, Lincolnshire, he 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 wrote something like, "Everyone's despondent, you know, at the news from France. We, you know, the the how do we tell our families that we, the creme de la creme, have been kept on the sidelines of this?" And then he says, "There's nothing for it but to go out and get drunk." And so they all sort of went off to Grantham and places like that to, to, to drown their sorrows that they hadn't been picked for, you know, the opening of the second front. <laughs> I do wonder when you get sort of Urquhart coming in and, and uh, Bob Browning, what you're actually saying is a new regiment struggling for doc, you know, almost a doctrine and, and an identity, and identity. So you get all these new people arriving with new ideas. And then that hits the old sweats who've been there for a long time going, no, well, that doesn't, we know that doesn't work. And they go, no, 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 this is how we're going to do it. And, 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 and perhaps, well, I was going to say, I was going to come to Market Garden. I was going to ask rather than pick through the fighting because that we could be here for, for hours. I was going to say, how much do you think Market Garden, the, the problem at, uh, for, for the operation? is one of command and control because you've got Urquhart going in. Brown, boy Browning decides he's got to go in. How much can we put the failure of market gun rather than the troops who are landing during the day? And many, many respects, the troops aren't, can't be faulted. Uh, you know, everybody has their ideas, don't they? There's a lot of counterfactuals about, well, if only they'd gone up there within 48 hours and, you know, if only this lot had moved faster, Americans had taken the Nijmegen Bridge faster. There are lots of ideas and, and in themselves, none of them, that, that none of them are bad, you know, they, they, they've all got some merit, I think, these ideas. But my overall view of it was the whole thing was the most reckless gamble based on a sort of unbelievable level of optimism bias. A- and I don't think one could say, oh, well, yeah, but that's hindsight, you know? No, I don't think you can say that. I think if you sort of, for example, the controversy about, you know, did Browning know about the elements of those two SS divisions that were uh, uh, sort of regrouping after Normandy in, in the, in the, on the heath uh, west of Arnhem and then took part, obviously, in the battles against the air-landed forces? Well, yes, OK, that's part of the picture. But as, as many others have commented, firstly, they didn't have many tanks anyway. It, it was mainly the recce and, and one or two of the infantry elements, some assault guns. But they, they had some armoured vehicles, but not that many. But then if you ask yourself the question, and this is where I think it's not a matter of hindsight, based on what happened in North Africa at Udna, when soldiers were landed a long way from their supporting uh, troops who were going to come and link up with them, based on what happened in Sicily, in both cases, effective German responses had been brought together very, very quickly, hours 
not 48 hours, hours by ad hoc camp group, you know, uh, combat groups, maybe formed on a company basis or a battalion basis by an enterprising officer. So Pearson uh, and the 1st Parachute Battalion briefly take the Prima Sole Bridge. Yes, it's a, it's a coup in the sense that it allows the sappers to take the uh, demolition charges off the bridge. But they then lose it to a, a ad hoc group put together by a German captain on his own initiative who's landed at Catania Airfield as part of a German division. But he goes up with a load of signalers. I mean, it's not quite um, cooks and bottle washers, but he goes up and he retakes Prima Soli Bridge. And there's, there's only 300 of them in his little group of German uh, airborne troops. As I say, these, these responses to previous landings should have been clear red flags that any form of garrison or training unit that was within 12 or 24 hours march of Arnhem could easily be thrown into the battle. And when you start to use the, the compass to draw circles in, in, you know, in terms of hours away, you find that, you know, lo and behold, the day after they, uh, they drop, you get the tank company coming up from Bielefeld, which was a training company, but obviously their old Panzer III and Panzer IV tanks were very valuable against paratroopers with light weapons. Uh, and they're thrown into the battle, you know, I don't know, 12, 15 hours after the first day. It's not a matter of, oh, if only we got there within 40 hours. They're in serious trouble from the get-go. I mean, after all, it's, it's just a few hours after they've got into town that the link between the 2nd Battalion and the rest of the 1st Parachute Brigade is cut. And, you know, I quote Victor Dover, one of the 2nd Parachute Battalion officers, who, who's walking back from the railway bridge just after it's been blown. And, and another one of the officers in the 1st Parachute Brigade turns to him, and this is, you know, four hours after they've dropped in, and says this has all the makings of a grand cock-up. So I think the understanding was there pretty early on from the soldiers of 1st Parachute Brigade that this was a sort of desperate miscalculation. And, and one of the you know, primary accounts I found was Gerald Lathbury, the brigade commander, writing after the war, just a couple of years after the war, to um, Chester Wilmot, a journalist. And he, he said the plan could only have worked against minimal opposition. So, so they're sort of base assumptions. I've given you a very long answer to this, Angus, because... <laughs> it's a very big question. Well, it's a big question. And as we know, so many books and, and, and you know, monographs and theories have been expanded. The other thing I would say about it, and this comes back to the success of the 6th Airborne Division in Normandy and when they do the Rhine crossing operation, Varsity. If you ask yourself the hard question about what was exceptional about the British Army in World War II, and you might say, yeah, well, the powers were pretty good, and then we have this and that and the other, and all of that's true. But I would argue the thing that was exceptional, and I say this as a former tank guy, was, was the artillery. The artillery, if you look at the Battle of Normandy, when it's all going slick, you know, with, with their artillery support, and you've got your forward observers very smartly bringing in, you know, the concentration of fire as opposed to the concentration of force from these Army Group Royal Artillery units with this stunning weight of fire that they can bring down on German counterattacks and support their own attacks with, that's where the British Army has a, a really dramatically better capability than the Germans. And you see it in the Normandy battles, and you see it with Gale when he's looking at Market Garden. He says, well, the problem was the command arrangement, coming back to your original question, because they were under Browning of 1st Airborne Corps and had to be then switched to 30 Corps when they got close enough. His point is that that, that command arrangement, and his key words is fix his responsibility. Now, he knew that because he was under the command of the Corps commander landing on the beaches just behind them, that this general commanding 1st Corps, I believe it was, had a really strong interest in making sure that 6th Airborne Division didn't get overwhelmed because they were under his command. And, and coming back to my artillery point, you know, as soon as they'd got an established bridgehead, uh, even before you can argue with the naval gunfire support, but certainly as soon as they were ashore, with all of those different regiments, the medium regiments, the heavy regiments, Royal Artillery, they could bring just something fire to bear in support of the 6th Airborne Division. And same thing happens 
same thing happens with varsity. You know, there is just this mass of artillery that that just breaks up the German attempts to to but firstly to hold their ground and then to counterattack when they've lost it. Long detour back to Arnhem, but of course it's clear that when you insert people eighty kilometers from the nearest friendly forces, and they've then got to drive against intense opposition to get up to them, that firstly, uh, you know, on the Hell's Highway, the ground column, all the rest of it, that their artillery support is going to be used just helping them to get through and keeping the corridor open. We know the corridor was severed a couple of times. And even when they get very close, when it's near the end in the cauldron and and at last the artillery, the medium regiment from, I think it was the... um, was it the Welsh division? I can't remember, but they they fire in support of the paratroopers, beleaguered in the cauldron, and and you know that that suddenly lifts the spirits of the of the besieged men. Even then, the amount of fire that they can bring to bear is pretty limited because of the range and all the other tasks that they need to assign that regiment to, field regiment, Royal Artillery, and that's the key thing they haven't had. Whereas the Germans compressing the cauldron day after day, have got their mortars and artillery, other forms of artillery, just thumping away. Uh, with a secure supply of ammunition. It's a massive factor, I think, in what happened at market level. That, that's a fascinating point. I'm not considered but so is that the, uh, you know, because is a, a success, a huge success for the airborne. Is that is that the crucial extra factor? Because they don't actually drop that far. They have artillery support when they drop for Varsity, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I when I did the talk um, the other day at the National Army Museum, I came up with this phrase, that, that Operation Varsity was an airborne operation designed by health and safety. <laughs> because actually what they've tried to do with it, uh, and it was an American cool command, remember, they tried to eliminate all the jeopardy that hard-won experience had taught them. So, yes, obviously they do it by daytime rather than at night. They try and land the whole force as a single wave, not as successive waves as they had done, you know, in Normandy and, and uh, Market Garden. and of course. They make sure that the objectives along this uh, river that runs almost parallel with the Rhine, the Vesel, they they basically they set objectives of bridges and other places along that line, that they are effectively what you might say one tactical bound ahead of the um, Rhine crossing itself, so that the forces that get across have only got to motor for like an hour or two to relieve the paratroopers. Now, even with opposition, obviously. They, they get absolutely blitzed on the morning of Ryan Crossing in order to try and reduce the opposition. And if you read the accounts, for example, from the 7th Parachute Battalion of Varsity, I mean, literally a few hours after they land, the first tanks are appearing and uh, it's crack on. And they then, they then walk 300, march 300 kilometres across the north uh, of Germany till they get all the way to the Baltic by VE Day. But yeah, it's a very well-planned operation. But I think, as you hinted in your question, the 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 objectives were set in quite a modest way as to what they should have to achieve and then you know even then you can say still very tricky i mean if you look at the number a key role was given there to the air landed troops to go in and land almost on these bridges across the basin but the number of gliders that were either shot out of the sky or heavily damaged i mean they're shocking figures hundreds hundreds of the gliders were hit by german flak as they came in Obviously, broad daylight, so it still had its challenges as an operation and, and and considerable losses. But yeah, it was it was designed in a way that would, you know, they hoped guarantee success. So if we if we reflect back on the airborne forces of the war, did they deliver the goods? Were they worth uh, the tremendous amount of effort that had been uh, put into them? Well, I would say yes. Um, I mean, I think. You know, we, we started off with early days when people weren't quite sure what they were for. The numbers were very small. Britain was on the back foot strategically. It was a case of sort of trying to keep the war alive with resistance or, or raiding operations. Then I think everybody understood as the thing grew and Browning grew it, it wasn't really going to come into its own until the strategic initiative had passed to the Allies. And they were getting into the business of invading Italy and invading France. And at that point, they understood that in order to ease their people through congested bridgeheads, the ability to drop in depth or the ability to drop on the flanks of the bridgehead or to interdict 
you know, take bridges that might be used by enemy forces, trying to counterattack, all those things was really vital. And so it turned out to be, you know, uh, uh, both in, in, it, in Italy and on D-Day, it, it turned out to be absolutely vital uh, for gaining a foothold, but first in Italy and then in France. So, so in that sense, I think the investment was very well justified. I know some people, uh, and there used to be a bit of a feeling about this in the army back in the day, that, that people would say, oh, well, it, you know, it creams off a lot of the best soldiers and then they're not in action, or they only seldom go into action. Well, I think, yes, it did cream off many of the best soldiers. I think that bit is true. But boy, oh boy, you know, I mean, those guys in the 1st Parachute Brigade, I mean, they were fighting in North Africa, in Italy. I mean, I, I do a little comparison in, in, in near the end of the book where we're considering this question of strategic utility with the 52nd Lowland Division, which, you know, it was involved in the fall of France. It was then brought back. And then for like a year or two, they trained them to be a mountain division. They thought, oh, we might need them in Norway, or we have to have a credible threat to Norway to keep the Germans tied up there and to keep lots of troops tied down. And obviously they didn't do that. Then they thought, well, maybe they need to be air-landed troops, you know, Browning with his ambitions for the core level of command. Well, we'll have two airborne divisions, but we'll also have an air-portable division that can be brought in. And that was part at one at one stage of the Market Garden plan, the idea that that you could seize an airfield and fly in the 52nd Lowland Division. Anyway, they didn't go out into action between the fall of France in 1940 and October 1944 when they were used in the Low Countries uh, as part of the, you know, the battle to secure Antwerp. Uh, and then it had an incredibly tough war for the remainder of the war, you know. So you could say to yourself, well, hang on a minute, during that time, the parachute brigades were fighting in North Africa and Italy and all the rest of it suffering terribly, but contributing to victory. So uh, there were lots of other units. You know, I mean, if you look at all the air defence units, which in the end, in the latter part of the war, got, got raided for personnel because, you know, air defences around Manchester or Southampton or whatever, come 1944, were rarely being challenged by the Luftwaffe, but they were soaking up hundreds of thousands of troops. So there's lots of other uses of of, of people. I think someone's calculated that the the airborne force that was in Europe and the Mediterranean theatre was around 28,000 at the time. And even if you include the global uh, airborne force, it, it, was, it was less than 2% of the strength of the army. And I think if you say, well, it was part of the reason why the Germans tied down dozens of divisions in an arc from Norway through the uh, Netherlands, Belgium, France, because of the possibility of large-scale sea or air landing operations. And I think you can say, well, that is strategic utility. If with two airborne divisions and a few commando brigades, we've caused them to tie down, you know, 30 or 40 divisions. I think that's a good strategic investment, plus, of course, the, the battlefield role that they played. Indeed. Well, Mark, thank you for your time. I think, as I said before we started, I very much enjoyed your book, Low listener, if you want to read an authorised history of the Paras, Mark's book is Red Devils, Trailblazers of the Parachute Regiment in World War II. I will put a link in the show notes and on the website. Don't forget, if you want to support the show, you can become a patron of the podcast. You can find out more at patreon.com slash www2podcast. And for patrons, I will have a bit more from Mark as I want to ask him in a moment, about conscientious objectors who are with the Parachute Regiment. So in the next episode, uh, we should be looking at the Waffen SS and I'll be joined once more by Anthony Tucker-Jones. Until then, I'm Angus Wallace and thanks for listening. Jerry, 88mm gun hit over time, blew us the hell out of it. Stalingrad can never be repaired. As Allied Commander-in-Chief, I have granted a military armistice.